wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Oh, my God. Gosh, we're coming here with another great podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you guys being here today. We have a most amazing guest, brilliant multi-book author, and uh, he's coming with us to share this exciting, powerful new novel that they've developed. It's going to blow your mind, kind of the format they built this in from their own experience and everything else, and we're going to be talking about this book. This is a book that you'll probably see in a movie someday. I would put money if this become a movie. You never know, but I think it would. I would put money on it. I'd buy the NFT of it if you're familiar with the latest technology. You're, I'd put Bitcoin on it. Let's put it that way. So anyway, guys, we're going to be talking with the author today, and... If you want to see the video version of it, they have this new technology out called YouTube.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can go there and for an unlimited time, you can get this special deal that we've got going on. You can hit the bell notification and get notifications of all the wonderful things that they're going to uh, send you across your mobile devices. But what's great is you'll be able to find out about brilliant authors like the one we have on today. Also go to goodreads.com for just Chris Voss. You can go to all of our groups on Facebook as well and LinkedIn and also Instagram. Today we have one of the authors from the brilliant new novel. This thing launched on March 9th, 2021. So it's just hot off the presses. In fact, I've got the book here. It's still steaming, I think, when it comes down to it. The book is 2034, a novel of the next world war. It's written by Elliot Ackerman and Admiral James Stravridis. And uh, let me tell you about uh, the gentleman, one of them we have here today, Elliot. Elliot is the author of the novels 2034, Red Dress in Black and White, Waiting for Eden, Dark at the Crossing, and Green on Blue, as well as the memoir, Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. His books have been nominated for the National Book Award, the Andrew Carnegie Medal in both fiction and nonfiction, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, among others. His writing often appears in Esquire, The New Yorker, The New York Times, where he is a contributing opinion writer, and his stories have been included in the Best American Short Stories and the Best American Travel Writing. He is both a former White House fellow and Marine. He served, wow, five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. He divides his time between New York City and Washington, D.C., and he's given some of that time to spend with us here today. Welcome to the show, Elliot. How are you? I'm good. Thanks a lot for having me, Chris. There you go. You like my lead up? We tried to do as, as best a lead up as we could there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So there you go. So we have one of the two great authors that are here today, and uh, you guys have written this extraordinary book. It's exciting. It's thrilling. And it's very much based in reality, which we'll talk about in how you guys led this up. And of course, you guys both used your uh, strategic military experience in ported into this book, which gives it, I think, even a more real effect. Uh, give us your plugs, Elliot, it's where people can find you guys on the interwebs and order up this book. Oh, sure. So I'm at very easy, elliotackerman.com. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, same thing, at Elliot Ackerman. And uh, the Admiral is uh, admiralstav.com, S-T-A-V. And, and the book is, obviously you can get it on Amazon, but hey, this has been a tough time for independent bookstores. Why don't you go out there, support your local independent bookstore, pick up a copy there too. That'd be great. Most definitely help those guys out. You guys have some great reviews just before the show I was reading. One of the top reviews here is from General Jim Mattis. And uh, we've actually invited him on the show for his recent book. I think it was the recent book or a, I think he's got one or two. But we invited him on. Uh, he's got a great uh, review of this here. I, mean, I think getting great generals to, to say this is a good book and you never know what can happen. Robert Gates, of course, Secretary of Defense for the U.S. Uh, 2006-2011 is also one of the reviewers of the book on the back 
giving you guys wonderful advanced praise. What motivated you guys? You guys have written a ton of books, both of you uh, on your own. What motivated you want to write this book and write this book together with the Admiral? We, we actually have known each other for probably the better part of a decade. We're both graduates at the Fletcher School uh, at Tufts, which is their school for international affairs. And Admiral Stavridis came back and was the dean when he left uh, his job at NATO and uh, brought me on for a semester where I was writer in residence. Mm-hmm. And so we had a relationship from that time. And one of, my, one of the bullet points in my responsibility as writer as residence was uh, talk with the dean about books when he feels like it. Like we'd spend a lot of time, right? It's just kind of, you know, BSing about books. You know, he's a deeply read person. And uh, we actually also shared a book editor at Penguin Press. And the Admiral had the idea for this book, namely, there's this sort of rich, there had been this very rich Cold War literature, books like the Third World War, films even like Red Dawn that I grew up on. We were constantly imagining World War III, World War III. And so his idea was we should try to tackle a work of speculative fiction that would deal with uh, a conflict with China because China is looming as a pure competitor to the United States. So he went to our shared editor with the idea. Um, he said, he said love the idea. Aren't you and Elliot buddies? He's a novelist. It seems like it would be a really just obvious collaboration between the two of you. And so Jim and I talked about it, talked about the vision for the book, and we were very much aligned in it being something that was short, readable. And so this book is not a total doorstopper. It's not a heavy, heavy techno thriller. It's something that was character driven. Because listen, ultimately, all the technology in the world can factor into war and it will, but war is the, at its core, it's the contest of human will. So you can't tell a true war story without really going deep on the psychology of the participants. And it's still a really good sized book. And really when it comes down to it, I was quite impressed, especially for a novel. Sometimes novels are a little thinner, but I thought what was so exciting about this book is I love the title. I don't know why, but the title is just popping boom there. And it's very close 2034. So we're, we're, we're the short ways away. And I think most of the, you talked about how in your, both of our use, we're probably the same age within 10 or 20 years. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I don't want to throw you into my old bus. We like Red Dawn and different things. We were always going to war with the Russians in a lot of different fiction and movies and stuff. But I I don't think there's been a lot of stuff about us going to war with China. And so this is a really probably developing genre we were talking about before the show. I just saw recently, it's been being kicked around, but recently about how China now has the largest military, which we used to have. And they're very temperamental about their little South China Sea and setting up those islands and everything else. This is a real developing story. And, and of course, with our crippling, what's going on with the pandemic, economy, this nationalism that we just had and fascism rise that we just had, we could really be asleep at the wheel and potentially be in some of these extraordinary circumstances that you put in the book. Yeah, I think you said it, Chris. It's, it's the danger of being asleep at the wheel. And oftentimes stories that kind of, you know, put a chill down your spine can be a good device for, for, for waking us all up. And the book opens in the South China Sea that you mentioned. The South China Sea is a, a body of water off the coast of China. It's the size of the Gulf of Mexico and uh, the Caribbean combined. It's rich in minerals. It, they are international waters, but the Chinese claim them as territorial waters. And to this day, the United States and other nations we launch freedom of navigation patrols through the South China Sea, where we basically take our boats and we go down there to prove that they are, in fact, international waters. And so one of the precipitating incidents in the book that kind of leads to this international crisis and eventually global war occurs on one of these freedom of navigation patrols. And so the book really analyzes how could one incident spiral out of control and bring the U.S., China, and eventually the entire world to war. And you guys, you guys, I think Russia might have a play in this and Iran as well. Well, that's true. So, so as the book opens, you're on one of these uh, freedom navigation patrols and uh, there's an incident that occurs on that patrol. Simultaneous to that incident, a, one of the characters, a fourth generation Marine fighter pilot, Chris call sign Wedge Mitchell, because a wedge is the world's oldest and simplest tool. He's flying his state of the art F-35 strike fighter above the Straits of Hormuz, which are very proximate to Iran, when suddenly he no longer has control of his aircraft anymore. Control is taken away from him and he is diverted into Iranian airspace and eventually taken down. And so those two events, which seem unrelated, 
you actually, as you get into the book, you see how they're very much related and how they mm-hmm. bring in not only China, but Iran, Russia, and even countries like India into this war. Definitely, definitely. So what part do you see Tom Cruise playing in this book? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just saying, when you mentioned the F- F-35, I was like, I was like, oh crap, this is another, this is, <laughs> he's going to, he's going to option this for Top Gun. I'm just kidding. The, the interesting thing about this book too, is you bring in a lot of different factors like cyber war and how that plays out. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and the, the end of the very first chapter, without giving too much away, is a massive cyber attack. And that's something that's not playing out in 2034. I mean, those, those, those are instances that are, that are playing out today. Two words, right? Solar winds. Or mm-hmm. remember a few years ago when we were all watching the Super Bowl and the lights just went out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was weird. They sure went out. We definitely have a cyber vulnerability. So do other nations. But when you add cyber into the mix, for a long time, the United States, we've sat here complacently with this assumption that we are by far and away the most advanced military in the world. Our primacy is unmatched, but and, and we're and our technology is unmatched. But that confidence in our technology has also come hand in hand with a reliance on technology. And what cyber can very quickly do is disable your technology. So if suddenly the GPS doesn't work and the F-35 strike fighters won't turn on, then what do you do? (laughs) And you've got, I don't know how many people are in China, 2 billion or something like that. You've got 2 billion angry Chinese. Yeah, it's, I honestly, there's probably people in the Pentagon that have picked up this book that are the guys who sit down and they strategize war and they run scenarios and stuff. They're probably, you've grabbed the book already and been like, we should probably read this because this sounds like something that could definitely happen. And, and the proximity the time when you guys chose the title 2034 how how dead set were on were you guys on this and especially the timeline because i would imagine when you're when you're calling a book 1984 i think it was about maybe what 10 years before it's time maybe or 15 years 2001 of course uh, didn't quite come in on the space odyssey part that we thought it would when you guys settle on the title what were some of the aspects that you guys decided to really go okay we're we're going with 2034 I've written a number of books. I could categorize them in in two tranches. First are the ones where the title is obvious from the very beginning. And I'd say the other tranche is the one where the title comes very late in the process. And 2034 was in that second batch where the title came later. We had some working titles. But when we first conceived the book and said, all right, when is this going to occur? At the very outset, I mean, we were way out there. We were in like the late 2050s, 2060s. Mm. And for a while, we were hanging around in the 2040s. But the more... We can imagine this scenario and we're imagining where we would be at and when we would be there. Like a, like the tide going up a beach, like the water just kept getting closer and closer to our feet. And we're like, oh my God, this is, this is like close. Yeah. We're going to be here within a, within a decade. And, uh, and then when the year 2034 came about, but by that point in writing the book, we'd been talking about the year so much that finally we were like, that's the title of the book. It's 2034. There you go. And, and everything that I, I read about the book and what's inside of it and uh, some of your different interviews and, and just the news of what's gone on. How did that play out as a factor of some of the different events that were happening in the news that you guys were like, yeah, this should either be in the book or take it out of the book, or this should uh, definitely influence the, the title? I think on two levels that occurred. I think one is we were writing the book, more and more events were playing out that made us feel the urgency of our, how our relationship with China was developing, how it was deteriorating in many places, and how it seemed like these events were becoming all too plausible. But on the more technical level, um, there are a couple instances where sort of world events like overtook our narrative. Uh, a specific one without giving too much away. And one of the key characters in the book is named uh, Kasim Farshad, and he is a Brigadier General, when you meet him, like a veteran of Iran's asymmetric wars. He fought against the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan. He fought in Syria. He fought against the Israelis. And um, he, Qasem Farshad, is the godson in the book of Qasem Soleimani. In early drafts of the book, we wrote it as though Soleimani were still alive in 2034. uh, And then in 2019, he got killed. So the day after that attack, Jim and I got on the phone. We're like, like, crap, what are we going to do about the book? You know, we got to figure out. It comes back. It's like Jesus. So you'll see how we handled it in the book, but that was a specific case. Obviously, coronavirus was something. We were working on this book before COVID. So we had to figure, we, you know, we didn't want to rewrite the books. We didn't think it was would be true to rewrite the book where COVID takes everything over, but we needed to certainly nod that this was a, you know, really profound and seismic event in the United States and the world. So there, there are mentions of it in the book that were not there, obviously, pre-COVID. 
There you go. So there is a it, there is a play out. So you you can read this not this novel and feel like these are events that could happen playing out in our current history. Yeah, you listen, you definitely see there are all sorts of today's overtones in the book, which is why when you're writing a novel, you're creating a world, you're creating an environment. And so if I were to say to you, okay, I'm going to give you a robot, right? And that robot can wash all your dishes and do all your cleaning. And he's going to be hanging around your house. What's more creepy? Do you want to, or what's less creepy? A robot that like looks like R2D2 and is clearly a robot or a robot that like looks almost exactly like you. It's like, hi, Chris, good morning. Like that's, that's <laughs> creepy, right? so Yeah, that would be creepy. No one wants to see a duplicate of me. They so, were- They've so already- trying to create this world that's sort of like, it's 2034, but man, it feels a lot like 2021 too. So, you know, this is right up against us. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd, I don't think anyone wants to see that. Maybe that would really freak out my podcast audience. They'd be like, if there was two of me, I could co-host though. That would be cool. So I think what's really awesome about this book as well is you've got the Admiral. And he's an incredible Navy admiral that to co-wrote this book with you. And then you've done five tours of duty. You guys are both veterans of war. You've seen the 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 blood, the the guts, the 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 horror of war. You guys have seen the strategy of war and and how the military, our military, and probably other militaries. I'm sure you guys probably studied other militaries and and how they how they did their exercise and stuff. And you guys bring all this to the table. So this is, I, I think Red October was a, like a really cool movie and a really cool book, but I don't think the guy had ever set foot in a sub, if I remember correctly. And so I think what's really cool about this book is you guys have all this technical knowledge that you can pour into the book and really build it in and give it that realism. Sure. So we were, we were definitely pulling from our experiences in this book, technically speaking, and then also down to, down to the themes that exist in the book. It's also a book about war, the folly that is war, and the fact that at the end of the day, war is a contest of human wills. So it's, it's a story about people. It's a story about human beings. So that is definitely, that is definitely what, what the spirit of the book was, was written in. I know it was a lot of fun to collaborate with Jim because we both had have deep military experience, but in, in, in different parts of our military and at different levels. How did that play out? The, how did you guys write the book together? Because that's a, a bit of a challenge. The way we wrote the book is we really went down and each, we did it chapter by chapter and we would outline each chapter in, in, in a lot of detail what, e, what every principal character was doing. And then once we felt like we really understood where the chapter was going to go, I would typically be the one I'd go off and I'd try to write it all up first and I'd hand that draft over to Jim. He'd go over and make his additions. And we'd bat it back and forth until we felt satisfied with it. And then we would move on to the next chapter. So it was it was actually a, a really, I had never collaborated before. It was actually a very smooth process. So I was pleasantly surprised. You guys are both really accomplished authors. You guys have a ton of books. How many books do you have to your credit? This is my sixth book. There you go. In children. Okay. Yeah. So you guys have these these incredible experience in writing these books, these incredible military experience. I think this is the this is just the melding of just great knowledge, technical knowledge, great writing, great writers. It's just boom. Like when I heard about the book, I'm like, this is freaking brilliant. One of the aspects of your book, you guys, you guys talk about several different rises of the power of women. There's some different women that play roles in this, uh, powerful roles in this book. Tell us a little bit about that and the choices that took you to that i think it's just real the reality if we're imagining what the year 2034 is going to look like it's going to look like an extension of what our military looks like today which is you know women are fully integrated into the book you can see the key role that they play one of the central characters in the book is a navy commodore sarah hunt when you meet her she's leaving leading three destroyers on a freedom of navigation patrol you you know you can the book is not really trying to make a political statement in that regard. It's more just if we were to write a book 2034 and the cast looked like the cast in the movie Midway, it wouldn't be an accurate. So, you know, we're not trying to write a partisan book. I think, I think American culture's got enough people trying to make score partisan shots on each other. We're just trying to write a realistic book. That's really interesting. And I agree with you. There certainly was, we, we've seen this play on our politics and certainly the rise of authoritarian and fascism comes from historically over the last at least hundred years from the rise of women, uh, people of, of different communities that are maligned or, or under persecution. And uh, suddenly they rise and there's a blowback that comes from a fascist authoritarian rule that uh, comes back to the male dominant hierarchy. And this is just a factor. And we've, we've seen this play out through, through our current politics. And w- 
I think what's really interesting is you guys submit this almost a year in advance. Most authors do to the book manuscript and then, and then it gets delivered to them. And I always find it interesting when writers like yourselves write a book like this and then suddenly it, it almost falls right into current day events. Like we just had Tucker Carlson, not to get political, but Tucker Carlson was just talking about women in the military and hence your book is right <laughs> talking about the same thing i don't know if you want to you know just comment maybe on on the lead up to that and how how it's interesting that you guys predict the future a little bit yeah i'm not i mean I, i'm not gonna i don't know what tucker carlson said but the listen i was like women are fully integrated and a key part in our military and they only make our military better and i can see yeah. that experience and having served aside alongside women i don't know what tucker's experiences are that are making him come to alternate conclusions but so i, I don't i don't know what basis he's saying that from, but shame on anyone who cast disparagements on women who are, who are serving in uniform today. But I think in terms of the craft of writing a book, ultimately you hope you write a book that stands the test of time, at least a little bit. You're not writing into a moment or it's not like you're writing a news story. So if you want to do that, you have to figure out how to navigate sort of the, the news cycle. And this book was one we were writing before the 2020 election, but we didn't know who was going to win that election, but we had to create a world that would be durable enough to seem plausible in either case. And in terms of our politics, the one of the women featured in the book is the president of the United States. Now, I don't think it seems too radical to imagine in 2034, we're going to have a female president. I think that is eminently coming our way. But what is radical is she is neither a Republican nor a Democrat. She's an independent because our politics have gotten so dysfunctional by that point that finally a majority of Americans have set a pox on both your houses and gone and voted for an independent. Boy, that seems so implausible. Wait, no, that is plausible now. That's that, that was what really blew my mind in the book. For those of you the show, and we have people that still watch our videos from 10 years ago, the Tucker Carlson story was Mr. President Joe Biden, I should say. I got to get used to that. President Joe Biden appointed several Air Force military uh, commanders. I'm not sure their titles, so I'll just say commanders, to the Air Force. And he had a picture of them in the White House. So if you're watching this five to 10 years from now, you'll know what the context of that was. And Tucker Carlson and responded very critically of, of women being in the military and, and stuff like that. So it was very interesting. Plus, like you said, you're, you're talking about females, uh, a female president, which is, I think, a, a good prediction as well. We have one that's very close to, she's the vice president. So there we go. It's definitely plausible. And I thought it was interesting too, because the, the commander in the, who's overseeing the American Navy, I guess in the book, is what kind of parallels are there toward Admiral who co-wrote the book with you? Well, I think there are lots of parallels. I think if Jim were here right now, he would tell you that she's someone who has spent her entire career at sea. She's dedicated to the Navy, comes from a military family like Jim does, also is very cognizant of the, the toll of that type of service cast on you. I think he'd also tell you Admiral Lin Bao, who's the Chinese Admiral in the Navy, is someone he identifies with a lot, as do I, or at the mid-levels of the government and know how soul-crushing it can be at times when your military officer would be riding a desk. And that's something that Lin Bao, that Chinese Admiral, feels as he's a military attache, because all he wants is to get back to sea. With each of these characters, we were trying to create characters that the, that the reader could identify with, that would stay in their mind, and ultimately, when you see their fates play out on the page, whether they're an American character, an Iranian character, an Indian character, you're going to become invested in them and you're going to remember what happens to them once the story, once the story finishes. There's, there's been a lot of interesting stuff that we've had on the show where we've had, we had a gentleman on who's talking about how America really needs to build up its resources in terms of people because, because as an economy, that's one of the things that has kept our place in leading the world as a military. That's one of the things that has kept us leading the world. And it is disarming to see what's going on in the South China Sea. And of course, China having the largest Navy. And now they just need the largest Air Force. And, and I think we beat them in military bases right now currently. But I was just reading one of the propaganda papers. I think there's three or four of them from China this morning. Oh, we're covering your book. And they were talking about how we know that the U.S. has more bases and so we're going to go for more strategic alliances. And you're like, they know what they're doing. This is usually when China puts something in their newspapers, they're signaling. And I just, I was looking at the book and I'm just like, holy crap, man, this, this almost makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, China's not 10 feet tall. I'm still very, I'm very bullish 
about America, but I think there's just certain things that we need to wake up to. Mm -hmm. Um, One of them is what China is doing in the South China Sea internationally, the way they're building out their military, the way they're building out the alliances that you mentioned. But we also need to wake up to our dysfunction at home. That we can't we can't keep behaving this way, and uh, and expect that there's not going to be a cost in the future to future generations. We can't we can't ignore the world around us. And I think on on the day a few days ago this week, the day that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle gave their interview to Oprah, it completely took over all news in the Western world. That was a day when China and Russia announced that they would be establishing bases on the moon. That story got zero pickup. So where are our priorities? Is it is it Harry and Meghan or is the fact that two countries that are openly hostile and antagonistic to the United States are now exploring the moon together? Um, yeah. The caller has me more concerned than Harry and Meghan. Yeah. And then you've got China has been just basically taking over Africa. Well, we've been asleep at the wheel the last four or five years, mining it for natural resources. They, they've been just foreclosing sometimes on harbors and being like, you owe us money that we loaned you. So we'll just, we're just going to start taking over land and crap. Russia has been, of course, making inroads in Africa. They want the, they're working on the North Pole. They're definitely, these guys are definitely making strategic plays in the world. And we're sitting around, what's Kim Kardashian doing today? <laughs> like you say, and hopefully there's some lessons here we can learn because one of the one of the challenges that we have in the moments that we're in is we tend to go back to sleep. We're already seeing the news fall off with, with a lot of different news agencies now seeing a fall off of interest of news. I've I've even followed back because Biden, I love Biden, voted for him. He's a little boring. You're like, what did Biden do this weekend? He didn't do it. He didn't tweet anything. Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm it's I don't know what to do now that I'm not terrified, but yeah, that's probably okay. But we we tend to go to sleep at these times and hopefully I think I think what they're doing is good on foreign policy. And we've had Dr. Richard Haas on the show from the Council of Foreign Policy or Foreign Relations. And so hopefully we we do it, but hopefully these people read your book and and they go, Hey man, we, we gotta make sure this doesn't happen and we just keep it in the movies. Yeah. I think that's something where you can do it. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? You, one of the reasons we have the dysfunction is because our politicians and our political class are incentivized to keep people angry, keep people fearful, because that keeps them, it keeps them supporting those candidates. It keeps eyeballs on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, and it keeps everybody tweeting all the time. But when you get rid of the, the provocateur in chief, the eyeballs drift away. Hopefully, we can figure out how to get people to pay attention to some of the other issues that, that are challenging us. And many of those are outside of our shores right now. Let's clean up our own house, and then we can make sure we're ready to, to defend against anything that comes to challenge us. Yeah. I believe I saw on uh, one of the interviews you guys did with the Admiral as a, as a guest as well, he talked about the, the surprises and the failures in our past of the surprises of, of, of how we've been caught off guard leading into what we've been talking about, like Pearl Harbor and different things. I thought it was interesting too. He he told the story of the the Cuban war, I think it was, where the ship had exploded and we blamed it on Cuban terrorists. Do you want to talk any a little bit about some of his stuff and how that flowed into the book? Well, I mean, listen, I, I, first of all, I would offer, if you look back at the last hundred years, I would say the great catastrophes that have befallen the United States, right? Let's think about it. Pearl Harbor was definitely one. I'd say the September 11th attacks. And yes. I'd say the pandemic. You look at all of those those are all failures of imagination, right? If I would have told you 18 months ago, we'd all be sitting here wearing masks, <laughs> we trapped in our houses, and I'd be teaching my kid third grade math and failing miserably at it. Like, <laughs> you know, And it's all come to pass. So if you believe that those are all failures of imagination, obviously the conclusion is that imagination is national security prerogative. And specific to the example you mentioned in 1898, the battleship Maine, which was at port in Havana Harbor, exploded. And in the panic that was that attack, newspapermen and others all assumed that it was an uh, act of Spanish terrorism. That led to a world war that we fought with Spain and cries of remember the Maine. And around World War II, they finally were able to do the salvage work to figure out what had happened on the Maine. And it was actually an internal explosion in the ammunition department. No act of terrorism that led to a war. But even if you're not big on Spanish American history, let's go a little closer, right? The invasion of Iraq for WMD. Wars are fought all the time on faulty premises and really fundamentally like miscalculations. Hardwired into every single war, the nature of war, hardwired into every war is a miscalculation. 
has to be because both sides believe they're going to win the war and both sides can't be right. So someone, by definition, has made a miscalculation. And it's interesting how you guys have incorporated this into the book and played it into some of the different experiences that go on. Yeah, it's sort of like it's, it's a piece of music in that you hear the same theme. Oh, you start to hear the theme the longer you listen to the piece and you can recognize those themes. And those are certainly themes that are in the book. War is hell and war isn't perfect. And, and there's, 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 like you say, a lot of miscalculation that goes into it. What are some of the things that we haven't talked about in the book that we should touch on? Oh, I don't know. They're different, char- different characters. One of my favorite characters is Chris Wedge Mitchell, this fourth generation Marine fighter pilot. When you meet Wedge, he's, he's out on patrol, but he's lamenting the fact that his, great-grandf- his great-grandfather had flown alongside Pappy Boynton, the famous Marine fighter ace in the South Pacific. His grandfather had flown in Vietnam, dropping cluster bombs and napalm right above the tree line. And his father had flown in Iraq and Afghanistan. But here he is, the last one in the line, and he hasn't done anything. And so he represents this uh, idea of a very classic uh, American machismo, can-do, simple attitude. And that's also something we look at in the book, is not only where is America going, but like where has America been and how is that going to affect our trajectory? So as much as this book is about China and international affairs. It's also a book that's really deeply rooted in America and where we are and what our future is going to be. Yeah. I think I heard the Admiral say he sees himself a lot in the female character who's commanding in the book. Does that uh, gentleman you referred to or other characters in the book, maybe is a parallel between you or maybe you painting yourself into the book as in, in a character? Sure. Listen, I, I see myself in all the characters because I wrote all the characters. But I think the most obvious characters where someone could say, oh, that, that's clearly a lot of Elliot, would be mm-hmm. that character Wedge, who I mentioned. And also maybe a little more unexpectedly in the character Kasim Farshad, the, the veteran of the Iranian Quds Force, who has fought in all of these asymmetric forever Because the forever war hasn't just been a forever war for America. It's been a forever war for our adversaries, too. And uh, as you get to know Farshad, you start to see how that war has shaped him as an Iranian participant. There you go. So, do you see what? Do you, do, when you wrote the book or talked about it after, or gave it some forth, afterthought? Did you? Were there any? Uh, were there any movie stars that you uh, would like to see played in the roles of the book? I think I'm going to take it on sort of Eddie Murphy style, oh. coming to America, or we'll just do all the roles ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, would that be you and the Admiral? Then you guys yeah, would we'll start. Be like, we'll be like Eddie Murphy and Arsenio. I I don't know, man. I mean, is, so is it going to be a serious movie or a comedy movie? <laughs> 2034 <laughs> serious comedy or you could be like coming to america too and just do the second part really badly in both bad comedy so sorry eddie murphy whoops i think eddie murphy just canceled coming on the show damn it he's a great he's a great talent i don't mean to <laughs> imply he's not he's a, he's an ex- exceptional talent actually you yeah. see the the characters that guy can play holy crap but i see some of the makeup and i wouldn't want to sit in makeup that long him and that other gentleman who run uh, the studios in atlanta i forget his name but he always does those great characters are pretty amazing uh characters most definitely. Most definitely. I, I, I'm just so excited about this book. I think it's, it's so true. Like I just feel, oh my God. And I grew up, I grew up probably a little bit like you did, but I grew up cowering under the desk, the little steel wood desk back in the days when they made steel and wood. And that was going to protect me from the Russians dropping the bombs. I saw the different movies, like you said, Red Dawn. And uh, was Patrick Swayze in one of those? Was it Red yeah, Dawn? Yeah. Or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like a bunch of rednecks are going to save us from the Russians, but I don't know who made a good movie at the time. There you go. Send, send, send the Russians in deliverance territory and see what happens. I don't know. But to, no, this is, this seems very close to reality. I just, I just looked at the premise of the book and I'm like, are we sure this is a novel? Cause this, this almost seems like a forecast of historical, whatever, something the Pentagon put together as a, as a plan of how this sucker plays out. So it will be interesting. And I think Biden, of course, is going to shape this and what he's going to be in. So that'll be four years. So 2025-ish or no, 2024 is when the next election is going to be. And then we have decisions that will put you within 10 years smack of the book and two and a half presidential 
things. So, yeah, there's still a lot of play in this that could go down. But, yeah, definitely China's uh, going to be some saber rattling. Is the current, I probably one question I should ask, is the current head of China in 2034 the same one that we have now, or is there another one? We don't directly name who the head uh, of China is. We actually uh, go all one level uh, below that. So that that's how things are laid out. You can, you can exercise your imagination on that one, but I could see him still being in power. He does have a lifetime appointment technically at this point. So there you go. Elliot, anything more you want to say on the book or plug as we go into parting? No, I think this was, this was a great interview. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you very much. We try and do our best at these uh, interviews and make them interesting. But your book is interesting on its own, so I had a very easy time of the premise there. Elliot, give us your plugs or people can find you on the interwebs and order up the book. Sure. I'm at Elliot Ackerman and on social media as at Elliot Ackerman. And you can find this book anywhere books are sold, but I'd encourage you to support your local independent bookstore. Support those local independent bookstores because they are the folks that have been dealing with this pandemic and they've been really struggling. And we want to, we can't just turn everything over to large corporations. Let's put it nicely that way. So anyway, guys, thank you very much, Elliot, for coming and spending some time with us. We certainly appreciate it. It's been fun. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go check out the book, 2034, a novel of the next world war by Elliot Ackerman and James Admiral Stavridis. He's he's accomplished military admiral and, of course, Elliot as well. Five tours of duty. Thank you for your service, sir. And uh, order up the book. You can, of course, get it in all the different formats. It's hot off the presses March 9th. So you definitely want to grab this book because you can be one of the first people to read it and bragged all your friends about how you knew what the future was going to be possibly before everyone else. Go to youtube.com for says Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification. You can see the video version of this and meet the wonderful Elliot at Ackerman. Also, you can go to goodreads.com, see what we're reading and reviewing over there under Chris Foss. And of course, good or uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all those different places. You can find all sorts of groups on the Chris Foss Show. Thanks, my audience, for tuning in. Wear your mask, stay safe, and we'll see you next.